Welcome back to helmets, and we will now focus on some other kinds of helmets. So again, we are in this section of the chart that you've seen a lot in this class, and we're going to talk about uh, flukes and tapeworms in this section of the video. So again, the way you're going to organize all of these organisms, and there are lots of them, is in the sections in terms of uh, epidemiology, transmission, pathogenesis, clinical treatment, which we'll de-emphasize in this section, and prevention. Let's focus on trematodes now, or flukes. So what is a fluke? I was always confused about what a fluke was, but if you understand that a fluke is the end of that anchor or the tail of the whale that looks kind of like the gull's wings, that really was the inspiration, I think, for naming these class of organisms flukes. Because when you look at them morphologically and macroscopically, they look kind of like that. So that makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about the typical case of our most famous fluke. A 28-year-old male returned three weeks ago from a trip to Kenya with this particular fluke as endemic. Last week, he developed fever with a temperature up to 103, occasional hives, and occasional cough and wheezing. Uh, he denies sick contacts. He only has had bottled water and cooked foods. So you know that uh, he's probably received this parasitic transmission. It is a parasite from sort of environmental source. That's not from a GI uh, transmission mo mode. He's sexually active with his girlfriend. He swam in Lake Victoria, which is probably the primary risk factor in this particular case. Uh, temperature is 101 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. As we talked about, no localizing exam findings. White count of eight, 40% eosinophils. Again, whoppingly large eosinophil count above 20%. And this is what he described having, which was swimmer's itch. Uh, and this is a disease process called uh, schistosomiasis, um, and that we'll talk about. How do you get schistosomiasis? Well, you get uh, these sucuria, which are swimming around in the water, in fresh water usually. Uh, Lake Victoria is a famous place where they, there are tons of parasites. These fork-tailed uh, sucuria then penetrate your intact skin and then uh, go into the bloodstream. Now they go into the bloodstream and they kind of love the liver and spleen in this particular organism. So they go to the portal uh, system and they eventually set up shop in the mesenteric venules. In terms of most of the organisms, that's what occurs. And one particular organism, which is in Northern Africa, uh, Schistosoma hematobium, it kind of likes the venous plexus of the bladder so that's where that particular organism sets up shop. Because these sucuria then uh, turn into larvae, which then move around in the bloodstream, uh, laying eggs. These eggs and the presence of the eggs and the inflammation because of the presence of the eggs is really what causes disease. So in terms of the mesenteric venule system, uh, that inflammation basically uh, causes portal hypertension and a traffic jam in that uh, vasculature, and what you can get is uh, a lot of uh, uh, enlargement of the liver and the spleen, uh, uh, viruses in the GI system, and many of these patients can die from just massive uh, GI bleeding because of the, uh, the obstruction in that, uh, you know, those capillaries in that area. In terms of the schistosoma hematobium, uh, which loves the bladder and the, the venous plexus of the bladder. Uh, the eggs that get um, laid there by the adult worms, uh, they can cause this inflammatory reaction, which can not only cause uh, hematuria, but can cause, uh, is a big risk factor for getting bladder cancer in the future. So when these eggs get laid, uh, they hatch into larvae and then uh, sucuria again, which happens in fresh water, the sicaria then affects snails or infects snails, and snails is really where the life cycle can be completed, and the snails then release multiple sicaria into the fresh water again to affect humans uh, in this way. So in the first 12 to 24 hours, you can get swimmer's itch, although another uh, term for swimmer's itch is really applied to non-human schistosomiasis that you can get from other kinds of birds and mammals and even in California, which wouldn't cause any of the disease we were talking about, but you can get swimmer's itch from non-human schistosomiasis as well.
So Kadayama fever occurs two, two to six weeks later. Uh, and what happens is that as the worm matures, you get antigens being expressed that cause this immune reaction. And this immune reaction can cause a rash and fever. And that's what's uh, seen as and known as Kadayama fever. And then finally, uh, in its chronic phase, depending on where the womb migrates, if it's the liver, in terms of Schistosoma mansoni or japonicum, you can get symptoms like in terms of portal hypertension and varices and GI bleeding, or in the bladder, in terms of Schistosoma hematobium, where you can get hematuria as well as bladder cancer. Uh, these symptoms can be quite chronic and debilitating. Schistosomiasis is one of the major parasites that we have uh, worldwide, causing a lot of mortality and morbidity. And you can see that most of the areas that are affected are mainly uh, sub-Saharan Africa, kind of the same places where TB is endemic as well, as well as Asia. Um, and depending on what kind of species that you're talking about, you can get different species affecting different areas. How do you diagnose it? You can diagnose it by stool ONP or by urine ONP in terms of that bladder variant. You can diagnose it by serology or histology, where you can find uh, presence of the parasites in various organs that are affected, particularly the bladder wall, for example. Let's focus our attention now on the last group of parasites, which are tapeworms or cestodes. Tapeworms are one of the most dramatic uh, parasites that we have. They're the ones that people uh, excrete, and then they find these long sort of worms coming out of their uh, butt, essentially. You know, recently we had a case in Fresno, for example, where somebody brought out their tapeworm rolled up in a toilet roll, and uh, it was actually when they uh, rolled it out, it was taller than the uh, provider taking care of the patient. So it could be quite dramatic in presentation. We're going to focus on uh, three main uh, tapeworms uh, that we'll talk about in this section. So let's talk about one case uh, that's quite uh, commonly seen at this campus, for example. A 29-year-old male presents to the emergency department following a grand mal seizure. He's a migrant worker from Mexico working in, in an almond orchard. CT scan is performed, and then what you see are these sort of uh, big cysts, first of all, and these sort of calcified areas. Um, both are pathognomonic for the disease process called neurocystosarcosis. And it's called, caused by the parasite Tinea solium, or pork tapeworm. So what's the life cycle epidemiology of pork tapeworm? Well, you can either eat the pork, undercooked pork, or you can eat eggs. So if you eat undercooked pork, you mainly ingest larvae, and that mainly causes GI disease, and sort of like your typical worms in the stomach only variant of disease. However, if you're unlucky enough to get uh, eggs as your route of transmission. These eggs can then hatch into larvae in your GI system, and the larvae burrow into the bloodstream, and then from, from the bloodstream can travel to other parts of the body. And pork tapeworm in particular loves the brain, so it can cause this disease process we call neurocystosarcosis. This organism is worldwide. Um, uh, pigs are kind of its uh, definitive host, so you find the organism uh, anywhere near pigs. But again, you don't have to be vegetarian to get pork tapeworm because you can have pig feces with eggs contaminating vegetables and, and, dri and, and uh, drinks, for example. Clinically, um, if you have the GI-only uh, disease, which you acquire from eating the larvae from undercooked po pork, you can be asymptomatic. If you get the egg variant uh, causing uh, cystosarcosis, you can get seizures, like in this case, because of the space-occupying lesion that these cysts uh, produce. You can get hydrocephalus, and you can also get nodules uh, seen in the muscles as the larvae sort of migrate from the GI system after being hatched out of the eggs to other parts of your body. How do you diagnose it? Well, you can diagnose the tapeworm variant from ova and parasites, uh, and you can diagnose uh, the cystosarcosis variant from serology. So usually an ELISA and IgG is the way you diagnose it. And as seen in this case, the CT scan can be quite uh, pathognomonic with calcifications as well as cysts. We talked a lot about the transmission cycle already, but this is a review from the CDC uh, uh, diagram. Uh, 
showing that uh, you can get cystic basically from ingestion of egg, eggs from contaminated food, and that, that can then uh, transport itself to other parts of the body, including the brain. But you don't need to be uh, infected uh, only by undercooked pork, which is the GI variant. You can get infected by eggs, as we pointed out, and that can cause even more serious disease. So the pearl is that you can still get infected with pork tapeworm, even if you're a vegetarian via the egg variant, the egg-contaminated food. Let's talk about another kind of parasite. Uh, this is a typical case of 45-year-old presenting with one month of worsening right upper quadrant pain, immigrated to the US from Greece where he had worked as a shepherd of sheep. So when you do an ultrasound, you'd see these things that kind of look like aliens. They are very, very uh, obvious, these huge cysts taking up almost all of the belly or the abdomen of this particular patient. And he's a pretty young guy. Um, uh, and then when you look at the liver uh, in a CT scan, you can basically find like these sort of like hugely insisted areas that again, taking up a lot of space in this particular organ. So this is a kind of caucus, what we also known as a uh, dog tapeworm. Um, so the dog is a primary host. Uh, it hangs out in the dog. It loves the dog. It goes to the GI system of the dog, the adult parasites uh, mate in the GI entrails of the dog, um, and then it gets passed out, the eggs get passed out, the sheep can eat the eggs, and then the sheep can be a secondary host as well. But what happens is that the human can sometimes get contaminated with the parasite by uh, accidental ingestion of these eggs, either from contaminated dog feces a lot of times in Europe and Asia. The human is a dead end host, so it can't really complete its life cycle in the human like unlike strongyloides, for example. And what you can see happening is that, again, the dog, the mature uh, parasites mate in the dog's GI system, release the eggs, uh, we can ingest the eggs, or the sheep can ingest the eggs. We get these things called oncospheres hatching out of the eggs. And these oncospheres love the liver, the lungs, and other kinds of organs, uh, CNS system, for example, in humans where they go and they make these kind of alien looking uh, formations with these huge cysts and daughter cysts as we call, uh, call, call them. And these cysts uh, cause a lot of symptoms because they are very, very large and they can cause um, uh, abdominal pain, obstruction, um, can even sometimes disrupt the synthetic function of the liver, although not very commonly. So clinically, again, as I mentioned, you can get abdominal pain uh, when it's mainly residing in the liver area. And what happens is sometimes these cysts can rupture, and because these cysts contain fluid that contains antigens from the parasite, which we can get sensitized to, we can get anaphylactic shock if these cysts rupture and they go into the bloodstream, for example. So that's why sometimes when people try to aspirate these cysts and they're not very careful, and you get contamination into the bloodstream, people can have anaphylaxis and, and basically get very ill or die. How do you diagnose it? Well, nothing really looks like this apart from a kind of caucus. You slap an ultrasound on and you see these things really looking like aliens that are really taking up almost all of the belly. You can also diagnose it by serology, but the imaging is very, very, very correct, characteristic. You treat uh, depending on the stage and the size. Uh, we're not focusing on antiparasitics. And again, as I mentioned in this section, people can sometimes do surgery, but you're gonna be very careful not to release the contents of the cysts into the bloodstream because again, you can get anaphylaxis and die. Let's move on to another uh, type of tapeworm. 32 man, year old man presents with three months of worsening fatigue. Anemia is detected on CBC. And then you can see the CBC smear where this is a macroscopic kind of anemia. So the vi vitamin B12 level is low. You do an endoscopy and you find this tapeworm. So that's a tapeworm that's just kind of uh, hooking on. You've seen the end of the tapeworm that's coming out from the intestines uh, as you do in the endoscopy. So I just wanted to say a few words about anti-helminthics. We intentionally didn't emphasize them a lot in this section because there are many of them and you can always look them up in clinical practice when you do encounter a particular patient with a parasitic infection. But we do want you to recognize that there are common par anti-parasitics around, albendazole, praziquantel, and ivermectin. And one pearl to remember is that Albendazole has the word bend in it, so 
many of the round worms, for example, or bendy things are treated with albendazole. So, you know, just for your memory aid, I know you guys like that. So here it is. So we talked about a lot of parasites in this section. I hope that uh, they will make sense after a while. I think each of the parasites comes with its own narrative. And if you compare and contrast, that can help you learn them. Uh, not too much detail, but enough so that you can recognize sick patients when, when they come in and they present with particular classic syndromes. There are some online resources for those of you who love parasites you can look up as well as, and we always look this, this up in clinical practice uh, whenever we encounter some of these strange and rare uh, presentations. I also wanted to thank a lot of folks, including Brian Schwartz, for helping me put together many of the slides today in this section. Thank you.